Welcome to My Truth, Your Truth, Someone's Truth. I'm Tammy Harlib, a.k.a. Reutemann, and I am here with my co-host, Christopher... Blakesley. Yeah, thanks for that first part. I would have forgotten. Exactly, exactly. How are you today, Christopher? Doing great. It's been a a long week. Happy it's Friday. Yeah. And happy we have an amazing guest today. We do have an amazing guest. We have the pleasure of (laughs) Sam Novak, who is the deputy... Deputy Editor of Vegas four one one. They give you like a badge, yes, like a star. I, I, that was a requirement when yeah. I accepted the job. I yeah. A badge. No, no holster or anything like that. <laughs> no yet. holster. So, tell me, welcome first of all. Thank you. I have a little bit of cough and my head's a little in the uh, clouds. Well, it's this only like cough ten degrees like... outside right now. Thank goodness for a warm coffee. Yeah. Pe- people but... don't realize how cold Vegas gets. I know. And that's why we've got Mr. Vegas here. That's uh, right. I, 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 there are <laughs> people way more qualified to carry that title than me. Well, yeah. but but it is freezing here. It yes. is freezing. And uh, I woke up to snow yesterday morning at my house. Did you really? Yes. Oh, that's amazing. I got up at four o'clock in the morning thanks to my little kitty Molly who oh, good. dive bombed onto my face. <laughs> uh, heard something going on outside my window. Looked out, and the snow was coming down. Nice. Hey, that, that Did you make happens. a snowman or get out there it, and make snow angels? It wasn't heavy enough for that. Just enough uh, to coat some things white, and then the sun popped out and it went away. Oh, that's but I got it on bad. video, so hey. I was happy. Oh, you did? Yeah. So there's proof of it. There yeah. is hey, proof at least of it. it. Listen, it snows so rarely out here. It's so much fun to see it. Uh, and, my first winter here was uh, 2019. Okay. And that's when we had the three consecutive snowfalls. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah. Oh, because I moved here from Oregon, and I lived. I used to live on a Christmas tree farm. Uh, Oregon Literally. Is, yes. Um, Oregon is the, the biggest producer of Christmas trees for the United States. Wow. So in the area that I lived in... There were farms everywhere. No kidding. So this property, it used to be a farm. Uh-huh. Um, somebody bought it and didn't plant in the center of it, but all around the perimeter of the six acres were, were trees that just kept growing and growing and growing. Wow, how beautiful. So when it snowed, it was gorgeous. I, I had 10 have... deer living on my property, yeah. and I'd go out every morning and feed them, and the, the little ones would be hopping around my feet. No it was kidding. terrific. Yeah, I yeah so it. what brought you to Vegas? I mean, that's a big Writing shift. about Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> right into that, Mr. Vegas. Yeah, it kind of, uh, it was something that just took off, and uh, it was a lot easier to uh, do it here than remotely, because I used to come down two or three times a month, fly back and forth, uh, attend as many events or shows that I'd be covering as I could while I was here, go home, write about them, start it all over again. How interesting. So yeah. you literally were doing a Vegas blog and reporting. From out of state. From out of state. Okay. Actually began when I was living in Florida. Okay. And then moved to Oregon. So I've been doing this for a while, but it was always from the perspective of a visitor. Oh, that's an interesting perspective because most people that have been, I've been here almost 40 years and I wouldn't even know what it would be like to come and be like a tourist here. I've got the advantage of being able to do both. And, and actually, when I when I relocated here, I wrote a column specifically promising my readers that I would continue to maintain that perspective. So I, I chose to live way outside the city. It takes me about 35, 40 minutes to get to anything here on the Strip. And so uh, I will make an evening of it, get a hotel room, eat at the restaurants, do anything that a tourist would do. And, and, and that's my commitment to my readers. Well, that, that's yeah. smart. What got you into that in the first place? Um, it was actually kind of offered to me. Okay. I was... Your charming personality. Mm, well, I don't know if you can detect that online <laughs> or not. But uh, I, was, I used to come here on a pretty frequent basis just for the fun of it. And I would go to uh, message boards, which were the Yelp and TripAdvisor mm-hmm. of the time. You'd go on there and share your experiences, your thoughts, opinions, tips, things like that. And there was a pretty popular site called Vegas Chatter that was part of the Condé Nast Travel Network. Okay. And I was a big fan of that site. And uh, 
one of the well the prime the prime editor the head editor of that website uh, appeared uh, that she was looking for people to add on to her writing team and she was scouring message boards and she contacted me and said I really like the way you tell things truthfully and you you know you back up your opinions with details mm -hmm. and your style is pretty unique what would you think about doing it professionally that's amazing. I know some people that could actually like use your help to tell the truth. <laughs> <laughs> well, be careful what you wish for because a lot of times it gets you into trouble. Yeah, no question about it. But so it's a really interesting way that you got into it. Super, I mean, it was organic, mm -hmm. right? Totally. You didn't plan on this. Not at all. And people just kind of liked hearing your opinion. So you said, hey, why, why not? Let's get paid for it, right? Well, uh, yeah. Well, to be honest, at first I resisted the offer. Uh -huh. Because I was concerned that something that I was doing out of fun would be something that I would lose if I had to do it professionally. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I used as an example of when I first moved to Fort Lauderdale. That was my vacation destination. Mm -hmm. I was living in snowy Cleveland, Ohio area. And all I could think about year-round were my two trips to Fort Lauderdale. Mm -hmm. And the company that I was working for ended up um, buying out um, a company down in that area. Mm -hmm. to uh, integrate it into their own, and they were looking for people to transfer down there. And my thought was, well, why look forward to your vacation when you can live it? And, of course, once I got there, working six or sometimes seven days a week, there was no more going to the beach and mm -hmm. living it up. <laughs> and my, my vacation became my workplace, and that was a danger. So for the same reason I resisted at first to take on this as a professional job. Ah, insightful. Very insightful. Well, have you always been a writer? Um, I've always enjoyed reading more than writing. Okay. Um, I was one of those nerds in high school that where everybody else during the summer vacation <laughs> was out playing uh, baseball or, or wow. what have you. I was on my front porch reading novels. Nice. And um, it was what, what type of reading? Like right? it, classics? It was classic science fiction was, okay. was my go-to. H.G. Uh, Wells, Edgar oh. Rice Burroughs, oh, um, yeah. things like that. Um, they, they, were, they were fantasy stories told in a very elegant style mm -hmm. Jules Verne would be a, another example for people who aren't familiar with those two writers right and I just really absorbed the way that the stories were told the uh, the, the 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 usage of words and painting pictures in your mind and I always got very vivid visual mm -hmm. images from the things that I was reading and then when I was uh, in college I took a couple of creative writing classes and prior to that my one of my high school English teachers she had told me that she thought I had a knack for writing. In fact, uh, the summer between going to college for after graduation, I was on my front porch reading one of my books, and this car pulled up, and this gentleman got out, and he asked if I was by name, and I said yes. And he said, I have a gift to you from um, your, your teacher. And he named her, and there was a box, and it was a writing pen, a cross writing pen, and with a note inside saying, you're going to be a writer someday. Let this be your start. Wow. And, good for, good. and you were. And, yeah, and, you and it, many decades later, but it did happen. So I'm hoping that I uh, please her and, and do cool right story. by what she wanted for me. Yeah. That's a cool story. Coming from a family of, of teachers, uh, both my parents were teachers. My, my father retired as one. I love hearing stories like that because teachers can kind of give you one or two ways, right? They can either <laughs> inspire you. Or discourage redirect you. you. Yeah, redirect <laughs> you. Exactly. So I, I love hearing that story. That's really cool. So we've got a lot of dots on the map. I've heard Ohio, Florida, Oregon, now Nevada. Prior Where, to that, I actually grew up in western Pennsylvania. Okay, that's what I was going to ask. Where'd you grow up? Uh, north of Pittsburgh in a little tiny town called Aliquippa. It was a, uh, was, and I speak in the past tense because it's barely there these days. There are a few survivors that wow. remain but it was a, uh, a steel town. It grew mm -hmm. up around the steel industry, mm -hmm. and when that collapsed in the late 70s, early 80s, yeah. this, the town decayed, and uh, there's very little left of it now. Yeah, very sad. A lot My, of the towns are, it, you know, it, do that. You, yeah. it, it almost, and I don't, I don't want to slight the, the people that I know that are friends still living there because they, they love it, yeah. and it is their home, but it is a shadow of what it was. Yeah. And um, there's decay, and... Uh, you know, things that were landmarks to us, like the hospital that I was born in and the school that I went to where I graduated, things like that are gone. The movie theater, flattened. Wow, a lot totally of the downtown gone. area is just... Just gone. Yes. Yeah. And it's, it's kind of heartbreaking. 
because a lot of good people came from there and a lot of people remain. But I always had this urge to go out and and explore and learn more about the world, which is kind of atypical for of the area or of the your area. There's, in it's, it's very it's very common for people who grew up there to remain there their whole lives. Yeah, yeah any small town, I think that's that's pretty much it. Mm -hmm. That people just get that comfortability of being there and don't want to change because it's peaceful. Mm -hmm. And I know everybody, and I know where I fit in, and I know what to expect, really. And if that works for them, that's terrific. <laughs> uh, uh, here I am Sorry. learning about the, the world and fantasy and mm -hmm. space travel and things like that. I was, I was eager and itchy to just find out what was out there. And I ended up finding myself in one of the most exciting cities there is. Yeah, it's definitely exciting. Now, you say you live out so that you can keep that perspective of being a tourist. Correct. How, how do you actually do that? Um, well... I, for one thing, I try to stay away from local politics unless it really becomes something that I feel is harmful and, and uh, you know, changing the atmosphere of us for the worse. Yeah. Uh, and I'll and I'll use the uh, Formula One uh, situation as an example of the Clark County commissioners voting on it, bringing it in, and it had a really catastrophic effect on so many of our lo local residents here. And continues to, from what I've been reading. Yes, yes, right. there are businesses that are still suffering for, for various reasons. Yeah, just by pure access, I mean, road closures, barricades, all those things. I've heard of uh, prominent souvenir stores and, and right. otherwise. And and restaurants that, that have been around yeah. for a long mm -hmm. time. And you've got that new ordinance prohibiting people from stopping and uh, yeah. on the pedestrian bridges, which sounds almost communist to me. I, I'm going to agree with you there. And but I get really riled up about that, and that's where uh, I have to step in. Well, not have to. I choose to step in and, you know, call out the Clark County Commissioner saying, you're, you know, you're making choices that are poor for us. What's in it for you? Right. You know, and, and I've, I've publicly stated on social media and on their own pages, I think that they should all be audited down to the penny because why else would you make such a yeah. negative decision unless there's something... Sway you. Yeah, Follow the money. It's interesting. Like, we're Las Vegas. It's kind of like the home of dysfunctional dysfunction. Uh, it has a, an interesting energy about it, but it's almost like I feel like we're starting to be micromanaged. Like, this freedom that we have as a, like a human being is kind of dwindling and dwindling and dwindling. Yeah, I that, mean, that's... when you have a, now I think there's another ordinance downtown. If you have a misdemeanor, you can't be down there. Uh, are we talking like or is it a uh, felony? Fremont Street, perhaps? Yeah. I, I, so I, I don't want to speak out of turn. Please do. Be, <laughs> <laughs> I usually do. I but, know. but in terms of the within that corridor, I think it may have been a trespassing conviction from that area that mm. keeps you out of that corridor. So I'm not sure if it's any misdemeanor. I think almost all of us would be kept out. But I, I understand well, what you're saying. I've not had a misdemeanor, but now we know your history. <laughs> I, I, when I read about it, it didn't quantify. It just said a misdemeanor. Yeah, and, and it could be. But, but the point is, yeah, they're making a lot of interesting decisions that are affecting not only uh, locals in general, but there's a, there's a lot of buskers and, and performers and musicians and artists that are kept out of this corridor now, Yeah, which... I found charming as long as it was done, you know, in a tasteful way, which I think a lot of them did. And a lot of talent was out there. And now there's no choice. Uh, they can't even do it. No, no, are, you, are you referring in terms of <laughs> Fremont Street or the Strip's pedestrian bridges for the buskers? And, and I, know, I know you're stuff. talking more about the uh, pedestrian bridges. Mm -hmm. I, I was referring a little bit more to downtown Las Vegas because that's where I live. Right. Is in that area near Fremont. Now, you do recall when they, they, uh, they instituted... Uh, regulations on how that was to be carried out. Had to have out. a business license. Right, and, and being yeah. a certain designated spot for a certain amount of time, which um, it kind of made sense from a safety perspective. And I didn't think that that was too objectionable because it, 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 it kind of regulates what's still allowed, but in a safety kind of way. And that totally well, makes sense. Christopher likes to balk the system. Uh, so, I do. You know, <laughs> he, he's not a good complier. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to see you with a protest sign on one of those there bridges when somebody's might... posting that they're posing for a, a photo next to such and such hotel. Did you happen to see what I, uh, I shared about Excalibur's uh, 
re most recent advertisement? No, no, but I'd be curious. Um, on Facebook, right? On Facebook. I kind of like briefly skimmed over. They're, 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 one of their <laughs> advertisements on the Excalibur page shows a woman posing on one of the bridges right in front oh, yeah, of the hotel. And I had to snarkily say, oh, the Excalibur is now promoting crime. They're, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know. I just love the way that you speak up for yourself. What Did you always speak up for yourself? Or did something kind of change in life? And now you said, listen, like I'm going to say it, like I'm a very straightforward person. Like I say it how it is. Um, if I got something to say to somebody, it, they're going to hear it. Uh, and probably everybody else around them. You know, I'm not, I'm not shy either. So were you always like that? No, no. When I, when I was uh, in grade school, middle school, I was pretty bullied. I mean, I, I was a little bit mouthy on my own and brought a bit of it onto myself. But I was, I was skinny. I was easily frightened. And, uh, and I took a lot of heat. And as I started to gain confidence, educate myself, work out, you know, and get a, some physical presence to myself, I started to get angry with that old person that allowed themselves to be picked on. And I'm, that just, I think, maybe evolved. Yeah, I'm glad that you said that. Because I think a, a lot of people, they see those types of things as happening outside of themselves. But really, it's the anger and the frustrations within ourselves, you know, that we put up with it for some, some reason. Sometimes it's just to, like, go with the flow. Sometimes it's like, well, I want people to like me. Or, you know, and just go out of our way to make people like us until we realize, well, the inner conflict is really kind of within ourselves. And it's not that I'm so much angry at being bullied, but I don't like it, but I'm angry at myself because I'm not standing up for myself and I'm allowing it to happen. Well, you see that in, in, in a number of people that they, 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 they're almost perpetual victims. And they're always crying about this happened to me, that happened to me. Well, if, if that's all that's happening to you is the negative things, maybe you ought to step back and take a look at why that's the only thing that happens to you. I, right. I, I got angry with myself, but right. I turned my frustrations into motivation. Exactly. You know, what did I not like about this situation? Fix it. That's right. Because you can be, be a perpetual victim or you can be somebody who overcomes those things either outside or internally and, and redirect your life to what you want it to be. Amazing. And it's always internal and then it reflects outside. I mean, we're our greatest teacher. Yeah. It's our interpretation and our perception of the situation that pushes us to try to resolve the inner conflicts that we're having. We can put it outside of ourselves all we want. It doesn't belong there. When you change, everything changes. People can sense that about you. I mean, I, I think that we can all relate to these days where you, you're going out to an event or just you're walking through a store, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And you're, you're, you've got negative thoughts or you're feeling bad about something that recently happened and your shoulders are down and your eyes aren't focused. And people will react to you that way. That's Sometimes right. I get up in the morning and I feel fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited about the day and I'm going out. And, I, and I'll use my gym for an example. I'll, I'm going in at the same time every day, crossing paths indirectly or directly with the same people every day. But on those times where I'm feeling terrific, suddenly I'm getting, hey, how you doing? You know, yeah. people are, yeah. are initiating conversation and... You know, wanting to engage with you, mm -hmm. and nothing else is different aside from how you're feeling about yourself. Well, exactly, because it's our interpretation and our perception. So if I wake up in a bad mood, it seems like everything is in that bad mood. Mm -hmm. But the minute I change, so everything changes around it too. And I mean, I think that's one of the most fascinating things about being a human being is to start being aware of those types of things that life is pretty individual, and then we're like actors on a stage, and then there's all sorts of characters that kind of present themselves to help us. We don't see it as help unless we're paying attention to it. But if you pay attention to every person or situation that crosses your path, and you really look at it from a bottom, not the top, so I don't mean the behavior, but if you were to stop and say, what is this situation offering me? What does this person offering me by me interpreting it this way? Then you get the learning. I, I've said that to so many people that uh, when, when, when something is holding them back, and I tell them, the, the world is from here looking outward. The, everyone else is an actor in a play that you create, and the world is your own stage. That's right. So you, you're, you're writing the story, right. and they're going to respond as characters. So take take control of what what you what you have, 
and, and make it the way you want it to be. And not only that, you know, when people feel like something's being done to them or they have negative type thinking, they pay more attention to that than the times when they're feeling good when the times when they are having positive thinking. So we're incredibly powerful, more powerful than we ever give ourselves credit for. So what we think is what we create. And so if we're constantly in that negative mindset of thinking, we're gonna give ourselves more of that, mm -hmm. more reasons to stay in that type of state. Well, one of, the, one of the, the, the tools of that concept is recognizing negative things and addressing them, I think. Yes. Um, and sometimes I get accused of focusing on negative things in my writing or, or my social media posts, and, and I counteract it with it. I'm not focusing on the negative. I'm targeting the negative to explain why I feel it's wrong and harmful and what can be done to change that. Why it can be made better. Yeah, and that's why I don't like the words negative, positive, good, bad. It just is what it is. And I think people probably with you miss misunderstand that you're going and you're looking at something and you're saying, listen, there's something wrong with this. And I want to bring your awareness to it because we're far stronger as a whole united community of the world than we are ever going to be by ourselves. I think it's a lot easier to accuse somebody of being a pot stir or a, you know, a shit stir than stepping back and looking at an even larger picture where, well, I may be stirring something up, but what's the ultimate reason that I'm doing that? Right. So it sounds right. like you're kind of describing maybe an ad hominem attack, right? Like they're going after you, oh, you are a pot stir, and I, maybe I, avoiding the truth of what you're saying. One of the consequences, for lack of a better word, of what I do is that not <laughs> Not infrequently, I will be confronted in public by people that are angry about something that I've said or written, and they take it upon themselves to just charge at me in public, stick a finger in my face, and blast wow. me. Wow. Huh. And I th again, that internal conflict, they're angry, and they what you angry. say is triggering that anger, but they can't identify that, so you become the target. And, and sometimes that, that hurts, and I question my approach. Am I doing this the wrong way? But everything's open to interpretation, and if and you can't convince somebody that your intentions are good, and if they don't know what's in your heart, and they've decided across the board that you're doing something that's bad, I don't even know that I can, or even want to try to convince them otherwise. Right, they'll well, they'll be convinced in their own time. You're, if at you're, all, you're not. If at, hopefully, hopefully the consciousness is shifting up, and people's awareness is jumping up to understand to look at things like no black and white. It just is what it is. Well, in those situations, I tend to like step back, let them have their say, uh, and just remove myself from it. They, what they wanted to do was to confront me. They got that. And their I've given some conflict. thought to why they felt that way and reevaluated my own approach. And sometimes it hurts. But it probably made them feel better. Yeah, so. but, you, but you're taking them personally, and it's not, it's not really personally. If you see it that way, it is. But, I mean, you do something amazing. You're communicating. A lot of people don't even communicate. Um, that's why they find themselves in situations where there's a problem and it's not getting resolved because they're not speaking up. Our biggest freedom in life is to learn how to communicate and speak up for ourselves. Well, and I, I want to back up just real quickly to, to being confronted in public, mm -hmm. right? One of the reasons we wanted to even have you on the show is... We want to confront you. We well, I think Christopher yeah. said he did. Right. <laughs> Hang on just a second. That, Let me brace myself. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no confrontation from me. But I am curious because that confrontation can obviously be unnerving, right? Especially when it's face-to-face, -face, especially for somebody that does a lot of their writing online. Mm -hmm. And then it's brought from behind the screen to in person, and I'm guessing that sometimes there's some anger and frustration as you express, on a micro and macro level. How, how do you deal with that individual uh, situation where somebody's upset? And then also, how does, that, how does that affect your ability to do your job, right, on a, on a macro level? Well, as you, as you noted, every situation is going to be unique. Right. Um, and as they, become almost part of my routine, I've gotten a little bit more prepared to get through what was once a, a big shock. Yeah. 
because you you rarely expect to go out in public, and I don't. Aside from the fact that this is a pretty memorable face, you don't expect to be recognized in public from sitting on your laptop of course. doing what you do, but it happens quite often. And along with that has become uh, uh, more frequent of these encounters. Mm -hmm. And at first it was very jarring. I, I, you know, I was I'm concerned sure your about fight or my flight, uh, you know, well, it, kicks in. I kind of just, I don't, I don't think I've ever been in that where it was going to be one of those two choices. Right. I just stop and let whatever happen happen. You know, I, I don't want to fight back. I don't want to get out of the situation either because it's just going to follow you down the road somewhere and happen right. again. But so I listened and thought about it. If I felt the need to explain a specific opinion that I had, I can. But these days, I'll be at a certain place, say I'm by myself, stopping for something to eat, and somebody will come up, hey, are you that writer guy? <laughs> And I almost want to turn around and say, okay, what did I do to piss you off? Because <laughs> it's very rarely, hey, I like what you write, you yeah. know. Yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> you don't get those, those acknowledgments of compliment or um, satisfaction as much as you do the, the, the angering Which ones. is inter interesting yeah. in and of itself, right? The human nature to, to seek out and comment on something they hate rather than something they really enjoy, which I think is kind of a microcosm. Bo both have yeah. their own gratification because you know at least that your voice is being heard. Right. Of course. And if somebody ha cares enough to approach you in that fashion, they feel very strongly about what you've said or how you've affected them. And I, I can't think of one circumstance where I've said, I don't want to talk about this. Leave me alone. So you welcome it. You listen to them, you hear them out, which is often welcome is a little bit more broad than I would fair. want to. That's I, fair. I accept mm -hmm. th when these things happen. Mm -hmm. like and, that's how they feel. And then and there have been times where I've walked away thinking, you know, maybe I should change my approach. Maybe I'm mm -hmm. hurting somebody. Or, but when when I circle back to saying that everything comes for for uh, the intent of changing what I feel is harmful, mm -hmm. then why would I want to pull away from that? Exactly. Maybe you should start another page on web on Facebook that opens up the dialogue to some of the things that you write, where people uh, can. My my paws are already in the the, the sandbox. I yeah, have yeah, plenty yeah, yeah, to do yeah. as it is. <laughs> yeah, but maybe it, it would help people facilitate conversation, and maybe you wouldn't necessarily have to, you know, be involved. It would be a page where people could go and and say. Well, this is what he wrote. What do you What do you think about it? There's always the opportunity for people to do that um, because I, I share all of my articles, not only on my own personal page, but also on our Vegas 411 Facebook page. And I maintain my previous page, which was Vegas Unfiltered, which is now part of Vegas 411. So okay. I share my, my articles on all three of those locations as well as on Twitter. And quite often I'll put at the bottom of the article you know, what are your thoughts on this? Do you have a counterpoint? You know, email me here, comment on our Facebook page. Open up the dialogue. Yeah, and I mean, it's, I, I'm not writing in a vacuum. I'm writing about things, and I want to know things, mm -hmm. and I'm always willing to learn yeah. what I'm not aware of. And, and we can kind of see up on our screen right now some of the stuff that you have written for, I think it's Vegas 411 mm -hmm. here. And, and I do want to get into that a little bit. I do, too, because... People might think, oh, he's writing about city ordinances or things that are happening in Vegas, right. and that's just a small part. Right. Mostly I, you're doing entertainment. Entertainment right? is, is my forte. I, entertainment, and I've even seen some food reviews, restaurant reviews. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, try not to get too political, but when there's a, something that needs to be said, you'll, you'll do that. But what it, you said it's mostly entertainment-oriented. I'm a big fan of entertainment. Um, Which forms? Live entertainment of... Uh, Production shows, concerts, um, comedy, magic, everything that Vegas has to offer. I, I, I attend all different kinds music. of shows. Music. Don't Mu forget music. Oh, absolutely. Well, that, that's concerts. Oh, yeah. But, but uh, I think a lot of people think concerts, big concerts. And I love the you, intimate venues, and there's so many local performers here. That are amazing. That the visitors don't know about. And I've, I've tried to draw attention to those things, especially with headliner tickets going the astronomical prices that you can come here and see a terrific terrific show that you're going to remember right. at one fraction 
of the cost of what you would pay for seeing one of the biggies. Yeah. Christopher has a law partner that's in a band. What's it I, called? I wasn't going to shout him out. Guys. The ego's already big enough. I know, I know. No, so my law partner, John Courtney, uh, we've been law partners since 2015. We went to law school together back in 05. Doesn't make John a bad guy. D- yeah, don't, <laughs> don't hold it against him. But, but he's in a local band with a few other attorneys uh, called The Lost Vagrants. And, uh, and he, he'll appreciate this. I think he has a show coming up at Soul Belly on January 20th. Um, but they do a lot of covers of, you know, 90s and 2000 rock. And they just have a lot of fun with it. And, and it is one of those, you don't have to usually go drive and park on the strip, right? It's at a local venue. So I feel like I'm supporting a small business. I'm supporting a local band. And so I get what you're saying that it's kind of, you don't have to go see U2 at the Sphere for thousands of dollars right. to have a good time in Las Vegas. And those are the kind of shows you're trying to highlight. Absolutely. Like. In fact, um, we started a, uh, an events calendar in the, the third quarter of last year where all of those types of shows... <laughs> They can send information to us, and we'll post it for free. Um, just email the details, the dates, mm-hmm. a link to ticket sales if there are any, and a photo to uh, events at Vegas401.com, and we'll put it up there. That's, that's truly amazing. And when you're writing, you're writing straight up. So I, I know that uh, even some entertainers have had a problem uh, with some of the things you've said about them in the past. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How does that different from when someone comes up to you in public and addresses you? Um, how is what different? When an entertainer, a bigger entertainer in Las Vegas, Gets has angry a problem with, my yeah, has a problem with what you wrote. Okay, let, let, me, let me step back from that as well and, and paint a picture of the type of entertainer that they may be and put them in a line with all comparable entertainers that would charge a similar price for that type of show. So you can pay X amount of dollars and see this entertainer, this entertainer, this entertainer, or that one. This is where my, perhaps my moral compass kicks in, and I know that there are some people in this line of performers who are what I consider to be not good people. And they've got a history of doing bad things, mistreating people behind the scenes, mistreating their cast, their, um, their managers, people that work at the venues. People that make their venues actually happen. Hmm. So you're, you're offering the counterpoint already? No, it's people that oh, oh, work oh, you for mean the them. Pe- okay, okay. Uh-huh. okay, okay. The people that work for them, that without them, you don't right. really have a there show. There is no show. Right. And, See, and then communication. They, communication. And then those same sound. people might be using their fame and influence to more benefit themselves than their community that supports them. So all those things taken into account, I would steer people away from this particular troublemaker Mm -hmm. because I think that they're harmful to show business. Right. And I will give a very detailed account of all the things that they've done that have been harmful. I have people email call me all the time. I have got a scoop on such and such person who is doing this, doing that. And, of course, everything gets taken, you know, with a grain of salt. And I'm not going to go post a rumor or share a detail that's one-sided and coming from one individual who may have a bone to pick. But when you know somebody who's got a history, a decade or longer. You're getting a lot of these calls and texts and emails about this individual. Right, and, you know, so you want to single those people out and say, you could do better with your entertainment dollar. They're not appreciating you, and they're using your money to do negative things, and that bothers me. I know so many entertainers in this city that struggle to make ends meet. They may live in an apartment with a couple of other entertainers. They may be working during the daytime at a restaurant, serving coffee or what have you. They're really, really struggle, and they're just as good, Mm -hmm. if not better, than this very famous person who's living in a mansion somewhere. And they're treating their guests like gold. Right. I've always thought when people make it like that big, the one of the reasons they're put up there is to help other people on a bigger platform. So it, it gets a, a little upsetting for me when someone's not doing that, when they have been given fame and they have been given all of the, these resources. And I mean, our job in life is to help 
other people. So when you're not doing that, it's just about yourself. I often do wonder how long you're going to stay up there anyways. Well, I think society has come to embrace people that are the bad boys and bad girls now. And I use Madonna as an example. In the 80s, she was very instrumental in using her power and influence to fight the AIDS crisis. Mm -hmm. And along the way, she's become involved in a lot of different charities. Right. As that era has passed, she's now known for her flamboyance, her extreme spending habits, which it's her money, do what you want with. But also, at nearly every performance, she shows up hours late. Mm -hmm. Hours. Well, I mean... They're human beings, too. They have their own struggles and inner conflicts. And sometimes I wonder, I don't know, um, you know, how getting rising up to such fame like Madonna really does impact them as a human being when there's so much attention and so much pressure and you can't go out with your kids and do normal things and you're, you're kind of isolated. I mean, yes, we understand when you get to that level, that's kind of what you signed up for. But I'm wondering how many people really know what that looks like until they're there doing it. Well, I, I would think that you could hold on to that perspective if you remember where you came from. She right. came from a small town. She right. used to actually have relatives in my hometown area. Mm -hmm. um, when you go out on stage four hours late and, and tell the people that have been waiting there, I can show up whenever I want, those folks who are, have now, they're going to be late for work in the morning in, in some cities, right. By the time the concert let out, the public transportation systems have shut down and thousands of people have no way home. Right. And she doesn't care about that and has deliberately done that consistently from show to show, city to city throughout the years. That shows a, what I feel to be a, a, a blanket disrespect of the people who put her where she is. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I and a blanket disrespect for her own self, too, uh, that, uh, you know, she's doing that to other people. Deliberately. Deli well, yeah, I, I don't know because I don't know her, but well, I can't imagine the the pressures that come with that type of fame. Fortunately, I don't know how well I deal <laughs> with it. Uh, but what I do want to talk about, since I've got you in front of me, is when you speak out about somebody, whether that level of fame, slightly lower, whatever, and it is negative. I'm imagining you get quite a bit of backlash from either fans. Or, or even them. the That's management. And, know. And, and, <laughs> does that ever happen? Uh, and if it does, how have you had to deal with it? It does happen, not, not too often, because in, in the big scheme of things, I'm just a small fish. Mm -hmm. But there is one entertainer in particular who I'm in the midst of a, uh, you, an adventure with right now. In okay. fact, coming Haven't here to Haven't you been in on an adventure with that particular person for a while? Yes. Well, and I kind of agree, because I've seen their show. Kind of agree with them or me? You. Okay. Good. Or else um, we'd end the show right now. I did a series, um, an expose on um, pandemic payout, payouts that entertainers were eligible to apply for during the shutdown that would keep their venues operating. Is this and like a PPP type thing? Man, right, I should have gotten not, this stage hypnosis. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it, these were not loans. There were, there, were, there were programs that where you could, you could apply for a loan that you would eventually mm -hmm. pay back. Or you could apply oh, the PPP, and get, yeah. uh, get a grant, yeah. just a grant okay. based on what you would have generated if the show was not shut down. Okay. And the purpose of that was to pay your employees, pay your rent. Mm -hmm. And it was truly meant for the underdogs. Yeah. yeah. And not a lot the, of small business. Uh, right? Not the millionaires, yeah. right? Yeah. And yet the millionaires could apply and throwing out what they would have generated, they ended up getting handed millions and millions of dollars of public taxpayer money. Now, this one entertainer in particular, during that period, received a substantial payment, and while we were all struggling to get paper towels and canned soup, this person was posting on their social media about renting a private jet, flying to Cabo San Lucas, partying with the Kardashians mm. and and boasting about it. Mm. A little tone deaf. While there's fa their fans struggle. While their fans yeah, struggle. Yeah, I didn't know that part of it. And I've seen their show and I don't think it's that great. <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, that person and I have been going back and forth and so for quite a while. So you spoke out on something that you felt was unjust. Did you lay it out like that? 
oh, I, I, I absolutely spelled out all the details. Um, I had the, the, because it was all public. I was going to say it's public information. Right. right? So I, and I had dollar amounts of exactly what these small, large entities received. And, um, then when I went to this person's new show, before it even began, I was escorted out by two armed guards. They, yeah. they threw me out of the theater just because of who I was. That's one place you hope you are not recognized. Well, when that kind of <laughs> I thing kind happens. of anticipated this. Normally when I go to uh, something that I'll be covering for work, I'll be wearing a tie, dress shirt, uh, vest, jacket, what have you. And this night I came with a baseball cap, glasses that I don't wear, an old... <laughs> T-shirt. Incognito. Incognito, which I'd never done before. <laughs> but, I mean, I really wanted to see this show and form a valid opinion on it. Um, when, when I write reviews of shows, I, I don't necessarily write in a vacuum. I'll give my own opinions, but I also talk to other people that have, might have attended with me mm -hmm. or that have already seen it, and we share a conversation so that I can see, you know, was I having a bad day? Was I not wanting to see the show that night? Right. Did the, the material that's presented just not grab me, but I'm missing a point? So I try to, you know... Should I go back and see it again? And, and I've, done that, yeah. I've done that too. There have been times when a, a, a new show opens up, and if I felt it wasn't quite what the, the vision of it would be, I would contact people and say, hey, you know, I attended, and do you feel it's ready for a review? Should I come back in a little while? When, how about you contact me when you feel it's ready for a review? It's the way that you want it to be. I think that's really respectful. Well, that yeah. was my intention was to go see the show, you know, without any bells and whistles, not to mm -hmm. be, you know, I didn't show up in an official capacity. I did not request to, to be there. Right. Tickets um, or you, right. you do that on your own. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so I, I ended up writing a review uh, uh, or an article saying I was thrown out of blah, blah, blah show, right. detailed the whole thing, my, my back history with the individual. Um, the incident that took place, and pretty much closed it out with saying, now I've been banned from the theater, I will never, ever get the opportunity to present a review of the show. It might have been great. I might have thoroughly enjoyed it. I might have brought perhaps hundreds of people in to see it that otherwise might not have. Now we'll never know because you threw me out. And that's, it's got to be frustrating on many different levels. Number one, this is what you do for a living that response from them uh, kind of indicates that they don't trust you to do a professional job with any kind of review, right? So it calls into question you. And it's also a certain level of disrespect that they can't even allow you into the show. More so than those elements, I think it displays a lack of confidence in what they were putting on the stage. Mm -hmm. exactly. if, if, if you believe in what you do... It shouldn't matter. It Nothing. shouldn't matter. Right. I mean, imagine, imagine a, 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 a shining review from one of your, what they viewed as a prior critic, right? Wouldn't and that go a heck of a long way? Absolutely. And that's not the first time that that's happened. I, I've been told specifically by PR people, you are not welcome at this show. Hmm. And, and, and it, it's, it would be, have been like a special version of an existing show that I gave a negative review on. And, the, and it's, the same, it's the same response. I was planning to go in with an open mind and hoping that I would be able to say, hey, this is something we're seeing, and I'm surprised. I want to share that surprise. And I, and I wrote back to the PR person and says, N none of us will ever know now because I'm not right. welcome. Right. And sometimes you do bring your own friends with you. Do you get their perspective on what they thought, and is it a back-and-forth dialogue Absolutely. before you write? Absolutely, and I could use um, the, uh, the show Awakening at Wynn as mm -hmm. a prime example of that. Um, I did not like it when it first opened up. I thought it was absolutely terrible. Uh, they can, can I ask a quick question, real quick, Certainly. just for people like no. myself that are listening that might not know what is Awakening a Awakening a, is an ongoing residency. It's an extremely elaborate, very expensive show that replaced La Rev, which ran at the Wynn okay. for fifteen years. Okay, I've seen La Rev, and so is it similar Cirque du Soleil style? It's the acrobatics, right. and, and it's a spectacle show. Okay, but it didn't. It did not sit well with the audience. Ticket sales were very poor. They spent upwards of $160 million to launch this show. So they, wow. had, they had a lot at stake. It was created during the pandemic. And so there, was, there were reasons why it wasn't what it should have been. <coughs> and I was absolutely appalled at it. Because for one thing, Larev was my favorite show. I had it seen it wonderful. 
35 times perhaps. Mm -hmm. It was always my go-to when somebody came to town, what should I see? Okay. It didn't matter what kind of show you felt like seeing, this would be one, you're going to be blown away. Yeah. No question. So I almost felt like this show had come in and invaded the territory of that, you know, that, that shrine to awesome theater. Right. So I did go in with a bit of a chip on my shoulder, which isn't a good place to be. I tried to clear my mind of that and, and watch the show for what it was, and I did not like it at all. Um, they ended up closing it down for over two months to totally reimagine it. And right before it opened up, I was invited by the producers to do an interview and to meet with some of the cast within the theater itself. And uh, I had the conversation with one of them, and uh, he had not re read my review. It was, it was kind of uh, a fun thing. We're sitting in the audience seats. He's sitting across from me like we are, just as mm -hmm. close. And his handlers were around us in the circle. And he's giving the same prepared information that I think he'd given everybody that sat in front of him. And then he got to the question of, did you see the show before this? And I said, yes. Then he asked me, what did you think of it? And I leaned in and I said, I'm sorry, I think it was one of the worst shows I've ever seen in my life. Man. And his eyes... Went back what, his, his, yeah. his eyelids... Oh no, what have I done? ...popped open like yeah. broken window shades. Right. And after a couple of seconds, he leaned in himself and says, now I really want to talk to you. Let's cut the shit. Uh -huh. And really, really talk. At which point, his handlers wanted to move me along. Because right. this was all fluff. They're, they were just presenting fluff. Of and he said, no, I want to talk to this man. I really want to get with you and, and find out what you didn't like. He invited me afterwards to go down onto the, the stage itself and meet with the performers, and I declined. I said, I've already bought a ticket with my own money for opening night. I want to see it as any other audience member would. For my own new opinion of it, just as anybody walking to the theater would. Yeah. And he said, well, that, you know, he, he thought that was a, a great idea. He appreciated it. And after that, I came back a few evenings later with three other people, two of them in show business, one a singer, one a dancer, and a, and a third person. We watched the show a second time. After that, we went to one of the lounges at the Wynn just to talk about the show. We, we talked a good 90 minutes yeah. because I'd already given my, my thoughts on it to myself, mm -hmm. but I wanted to see how other people yeah. from different fields saw see it. See through a different lens. And so we exchanged ideas and things that might have worked, might not have. And then I went and sat down and wrote a re re revised review because it's not my show. It's everyone's show, the performers and the audience. Exactly, exactly. And I think like that's a good example of how someone says, okay, that's a good idea for you to come back. We've made some changes, come back and, and then tell us what you think. And even ask, you know, what did you see that was like really the problems last time to better themselves? And I think even like when you're talking about uh, political things or things going, isn't that just to make people aware so that they can start standing up to better not only themselves but also the community in which we live in? Well, you, you, you by, uh, by inherent nature, I think we all want everyone to succeed as long as you're doing something that you believe in. Right. And uh, I, don't, I don't write a negative review because I want it to close. I write a negative review because... I, I, I specifically break down the things that I yeah, think. Yeah, you want them to be better. And, and offer, in my review, suggestions. If, if, if that's, you know, something that's natural to, the, to the, what I'm writing. You know, for instance, there was a, a Cirque du Soleil show over at Luxor called Run. Mm -hmm. It was terrible. Is it still running? It, <laughs> no, oh no, everybody ran for the exits. <laughs> it didn't last very long, but it could have been salvaged. I mean, they, they had the basic structure of an entertaining show. It was the execution and some of the cast that didn't work. My idea was, it was, it was what we, the premise was that you were going to see a Hollywood action film on a live stage. And it was created by a movie director who's known for his action films. Yeah. But it was done so poorly, and my idea was... Why not actually get a true movie star, perhaps one whose star has faded a little bit, might you know not be working like 
for instance, Jean-Claude Van Damme. Big 80s action star. Yeah. You know, he just makes a movie here and there. How cool would it be to have a real live Jean-Claude Van Damme movie or any other star doing that? Then you've got a real hook. Yeah. Build it around their persona, the films that they've done in the past, and I think people would have really, really enjoyed it. They never tried to revise it at all. They just shut it down. And did you have time? Did you publish a review on that? Did they? Did you speak to any of the management? Uh, able to express any of your suggestions, ideas? Well, I've learned more recently than than ever before that people are that are behind the scenes are actually reading the things that I write. I don't think that was the case over there, but I I have been told very very recently that my article on awakening was read to the company by someone very, very high up at Wynn. That they, amazing. They gathered together, read it, discussed the points, the things that they agreed with, the things that they weren't so sure of my, you know, they agreed with on my, on my mm -hmm. ideas, mm -hmm. my reactions, but they took all of that into account, which I think is absolutely fascinating. Yeah. Not I just think fascinating, that's truly but amazing. impressive. Yeah, I it's mean, very impressive. And something that us and our listeners can kind of take to heart, right? Like, a, as a professional, as any job that we have, we're going to be criticized, sometimes rightly, sometimes wrongly. What do we take from that? How do we react to it? And that's why I wanted to get into the nuts and bolts of you write these reviews, you state opinions, you stand on this island uh, to defend them or not defend them, but just to put them out there into the air for everybody to read. It takes a lot of bravery and it takes a lot of, you expose yourself also to some criticism, mm -hmm. right? When you're making these strong opinions. Sure. Yeah. And I think it's really important for us as individuals, as Tammy mentioned earlier, to not take things personally. This is my view of whether it's running or awakening or, or, or whatever, but, but stand on that opinion, but also be able to accept opinions of others, discard the, the bad, <laughs> accept the, the good and something that you can actually improve and actually be willing to listen to it. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, well, that's I, what makes life even more fun. I, I hope that that's what's happening. I hope that's, that's what I'm doing because my voice is just only one in the millions of us that, are, that, that come to the city and, or live here. Or in the world, for that matter, right? I mean, this is our job, is to help people wake up and live more peacefully, more easily, more kind and lovingly, not just to other people, but also to ourselves. How many uh, viewers or subscribers do you have on Vegas 411? Um, it's very hard to determine, actually. Um, I'm not privy to all the nuts and bolts. Okay. Um, even though my title is deputy editor, it's more of a symbolic title. Um, I'm more of the the face of the site. We've got a team of writers. We have a very important person who runs the whole thing. She's the heart of it. Her name is uh, Asia Mayfield. Salute to her. She's Sh wonderful. Shout out Asia Mayfield. Hi, Asia. Shout out. Great work. And, but I, I'm the one that, aside from writing my own little sidebar column, because Vegas Unfiltered is how I began, and it's been integrated into Vegas 411. So I have my own little drop down list. I got so you. I'm just one cog in the wheel, but they mm -hmm. also want me to be sort of an emissary and ambassador to the entertainers, to the visitors, to our locals. And uh, how does someone reach out to you on uh, either social media or on a website? Um, well, you can always email me, uh, Sam Novak at Vegas411.com. Um, the site itself is Vegas411.com, and we have a Facebook page where okay. anybody can send a message or comment on articles that are there. Um, I've been starting off the new year with a few new reviews of things that are going on. Closed it out with a three part of the best, worst, and WTF, which I always enjoy those, <coughs> those year end uh, wrap ups because there's so much has gone on in any one particular year. And by the time you get there and start looking back, you start to absorb how much has changed around us in just the past 12 months. Some of it's really wild. Some of it is routine. I just love those year-end wrap-ups, and I'm have, I have a great time with them. I could, I could do them for two or three months into the new year and, <laughs> yeah. and not get tired of it. Yeah. But it, it's really nice when you, saw, when you encounter, say, a brand-new show or a new performer. 
that's really blowing your socks off and you mention about it and they send you a note of appreciation yeah that's well amazing. well let's let's we while got, we're on it if if you can name some shows that some of our, some of our listeners should come in and check out that might be off the beaten path unless there's some kind of promotional you know prohibition or anything no no but, no 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 it's i i've been giving been given the license to to talk about whatever i want to on, on, it's my column. It just happens yeah. to be under somebody's banner. Yeah. So my opinions are always out there. I can t talk about my personal favorites. Um, the best new tribute show of the year was the Docksiders down at Notoriety. I saw that. It's a love them tribute to an era of tribute music to rather an era, than right. an individual it, it's band. called Yacht Rock. Um, Yacht Rock is kind of those easy breezy songs that everybody knows. They're kind of AM radio these mm -hmm. days, but they make you ah, feel good. Yeah. I have satellite. I listen to Yacht Rock radio all the time. It's they, great. And they, they, it's all live. All the instruments and the singers are all live. They, they came from Wisconsin, so they transplanted here, and they do have one of our local singers that they integrated into the band. Somebody okay. they had a space for when one person couldn't relocate, but outstanding. Every song is performed to perfection. The the, the energy, the, the the talent. It, you 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 walk in, sit down, and from the opening notes, you're grinning to the very very end. That's fantastic. Yeah, that is. There's a, there's a relatively new tribute show that were opened up over Excalibur called Spice Wannabe, which is a... <laughs> the Spice uh, Girls? The, uh, the Spice Girls. They're uh -huh. in character through the whole show. I was not a Spice Girls fan at the time okay. that they were popular, but I got caught up in the music and the energy and, and the style, and I had a really good time. I like That's hearing amazing. that, and it, sh it shows that whatever you think... You, as you walk into a show, you might have a preconceived notion of what you're going to think of the show. But I like it that you're able to let the show influence you, right? To decide, oh, okay, wait, I, I'm surprised, but I actually liked that. Mm -hmm. I didn't expect to like the Spice Girl show. Right. So it shows that you have the ability to, to make your own opinion, yeah. diversify all that stuff. So yeah. um, kudos to you. Another category of entertainment that I kind of uh, got into this year was the female reviews, which my fans, friends and some readers thought was kind of funny because I'm an openly gay man. So I'm you more are. inclined, yes. So I'm more inclined to go to Chippendales or Thunder from mm -hmm. Down Under, right. but I found myself going to these topless reviews and uh, enjoying, enjoying it or having a blast yeah. and going back multiple times. Yeah, yeah. And uh, two of my uh, top two, my, my top two uh, new adult shows were both from a, a, a producer, director, choreographer, performer by the name of Jennifer Romas. Okay. <laughs> Um, she had a long-running show over at Westgate called Sexy, mm -hmm. and then she launched one over at the Rio called Excite, okay. and that that's best new adult show. She and the second uh, second place went to a, another show called Red Velvet Burlesque, which is also at Notoriety, and she was brought in to give it a Vegas edge. It, it was a, it's a show that takes, that runs in a number of different cities, Yeah. but they wanted to give a more Vegas feel to it. So they brought her in to do that. Both really fun shows. That's amazing. That's amazing. But no, I'm not going straight. I just, <laughs> no one you wants still you. Happen hey, to enjoy the I show, don't think anybody cool. wants you to do anything that you are not. <laughs> you should definitely just be who you are. If it's good enough for you, it's going to have to be good enough for everybody else. No I, I, I know we have to wrap up, uh, but I just want to pull out one more thing before we say goodbye, and that is Sam also has a different kind of passion. And so just real briefly, why don't you uh, talk about what you do for a lot of uh, stray cats oh, in the I, city? I used to work at an animal hospital in, in central Florida, and uh, my heart would be broken by the time I'd go home seeing the things that were happening to animals. And... Uh, I ended up adopting a lot of animals that people would bring into the hospital that could be cured, but they just didn't feel like paying the bills and would have them euthanized. Mm -hmm. I would step in, and I ended up taking a lot of them home. And then I got into feeding uh, feral cat colonies around my area. I would always have sacks of food in my, in my car, jugs of water, and take care of them. And I moved here to town, and I discovered that we have a few colonies along my beaten path. And uh, I was feeding them one day, and some gentleman pulled up to me, and I thought I was going to get scolded because security sometimes <coughs> does that. But turns out he was part of a group that does an organized effort wow. in those very spots. So he drew me in. We exchanged information. We orchestrated it so that 
one person would go every specific day, would all mm -hmm. check in with one another to make sure that the cats never went a day hungry. That's amazing. And luckily, I've been able to uh, add some people as we've lost some. Yeah, he drew Tammy me is in. One there of we them. Go. She's been a wonderful godsend. That's great. We uh, had a really. Uh, I was going to talk about when I went please, first to please. go see, um, you know, where it is and, and kind of how they do it. Uh, Sam and I, I think, got an amazing uh, opportunity. Um, some people may not see it this way, but this is exactly the way that I see it is right before we had gotten there, someone had hit a cat and it was definitely struggling. And Sam and I were able to just kind of put our feelings to the side and really kind of bond with this cat and help it let go. And I, it was just an incredible experience to be able to help this cat who let go pretty quickly and pretty peacefully um, because there was, it wasn't going to survive. Mm -hmm. And just being there at that time, I think, I want to believe that that cat had a lot of comfort in what we did. I mean, we sat there, we petted it, we talked to it, and then Sam took it and buried it at his uh, house. Man, it's uh, those opportunities that you don't expect, but you're given to show compassion and love that really, I hope, is what this life is all about. And to I know, all beings. Yeah, right? to everything. It's not That's just exactly human what I mean. beings. It's of all course. beings. We're all beings. Of course. But I've, I've given a commitment to these animals that as long as I'm alive, each one of them would be remembered. And even in the circumstance of that cat, I had to give her a name, so I called her Dusty. Um, I buried her in my yard along with a, a couple of other animals that I've, that I've had these situations with. She has a stocking. That, and I have a, a very, very long string of stockings that go across my living room every year at Christmas. And every one of the cats that I've saved in some way or helped wow. in some way, uh, they get remembered throughout the year, but especially at Christmas. That's beautiful. That is. That's that beautiful. Is and so is, there, beautiful. is there a way that our listeners can support this organization? Do they um, need that support? It's not yeah. a formal organization. It's just, it's just a bunch okay. of friends that, uh, that do that. I would, I would think that if somebody wants to help, please... Uh, contact your local shelters or sanctuaries and offer financial support. Take some food or litter, towels, cleaning supplies, all the things that these, these shelters rely on just to get through their day-to-day. -day. Um, we're in a good spot, but there are a lot of places. There's still a lot of help. Yes. Yeah. That, that's beautiful. Kudos to both of you all for doing that. I mean, that's, that's a beautiful thing. I'm an animal lover as well. And, uh, we have to give back to our it. community, and that means everything in our community. No question. You know? No question. Sam, it has been truly uh, an amazing pleasure to have you on our show, and I hope that we can have you actually come back at some time. I would enjoy um, that. Thank you. Maybe a different type of conversation, but... Um, it I'm a little was nervous just... about the review he's going to give us. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but... Well, even though I'm here in the work capacity, this is not for a review. It's, uh, it's to, to, to share our messages outward, and I think we've all had an opportunity to do that. Yeah, feel free to review us, though. I mean, we, we can all always improve things. So, you know, be honest. You know, say that Christopher doesn't have a personality. <laughs> like, it's the truth. Organic <laughs> conversation is review proof. Yep, there we go. Exactly. And, and it was a pleasure. I really exactly. enjoyed it. Really nice Thank meeting you. you. Likewise. Um, and we really, really appreciate you. Last time, Vegas411.com. Right. And your own personal. It is Vegas Unfiltered. I know it's part of that, right. but just want to make sure we get all your plugs. We really appreciate you. Yep. Thank you. Christopher, where can people go and follow us? Well, on TikTok, you can follow us at Our Truth Media. Um, on Facebook, it's going to be My Truth, Your Truth, Someone's Truth. And uh, you can also email us at OurTruthMedia at gmail.com. And today, as always, brought to you by LBC Law Group, where lawyers but different, as well as... Danny S. Dynamics, where we help you create the life that you want from the inside out. Also, Christopher, can't we be seen on X and Instagram? Yes, at Our Truth Media. So find us throughout the social See, social networks. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. I give a he gets one small job and I don't know. Fire me. Mm -hmm.